Hello once again, and welcome to the Aurelius Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Naylor, the co-founder and CEO here at Aurelius. This episode, we had a chance to chat with Lindsay Redinger, the manager of user research and operations at Envision. Lindsay and her team at Envision have been doing what she refers to as operationalizing user research over the past several months. For Lindsay, this means making user research and the key insights or findings more accessible to everyone in the company. We talked about the idea of design ops and the even more recent community around research ops, what those mean and how to get started doing those things in your very own organization. She also shared quite a bit about how Envision is applying user research to literally every level of the company and how it's even been driving high level business strategy. Not to mention, she talked with us about how she empowers product teams at Envision to do their very own user research so that everyone is making better design decisions based on real customer needs. It was certainly a fun chat for me, and it was very inspiring and exciting to hear about their work that Lindsay and her user research team at Envision are doing. Of course, I want to mention that our very own product, Aurelius, is helping teams just like Lindsay and Envision operationalize their user research to get more out of what they're learning so design and product teams can make smarter, more informed decisions every day in the work they do. We'd love to hear what you think, and we have a 14-day free trial so you can see for yourself just how Aurelius helps you figure out what you learn from user research faster and easier to create those key insights and nuggets to make awesome designs, products, and features. Check us out on our website. That is AureliusLab.com. That's www.aureliuslab.com. And with that, let's get on with our very insightful chat with Lindsay Redinger. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 23 with Lindsay Redinger. She is the manager of research and ops and leading the user research team at Envision. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Well, let's get right into it. Manager of research and ops. What exactly does that mean at Envision? Yeah, so it's definitely an interesting title. Um, we realized pretty early in the growth of our research practice that a lot of our research practice is done through operations. Um, I know that everyone talks a lot about research ops now. It's a little bit of a hot topic in the community. Um, but I'm really happy that we've addressed that and are making operations such a key part of our process. That is interesting because, and especially that you mentioned the research ops community, that's a very nascent thing, uh, at least in my experience and, and with the the Slack group that's been dedicated and started there uh, that's popped up, it's been kind of a very quick, recent growth thing. But I suspect that's probably not true for you if, if Envision's been thinking about this and created this role, yeah? Well, I feel like a lot of researchers, they really find that they have to operationalize or turn research into different programs to make it successful in different organizations. So I feel like it's something that we as researchers have known about, but because the community is giving a name finally to things like design ops. We can kind of say, oh, that's that's the thing that we want. That's what we're doing. And we can call that research ops. So I've recently also joined that community. I, I sort of feel like it's a little bit of like the hipster community for researchers, right? <laughs> like it's, it's the new thing that everyone's talking about and excited about. Um, and I myself am obviously quite excited about that too. Yeah, for sure. So one thing you said there, Lindsay, kind of stuck out in my mind, particularly because it's being discussed on that, in that community, you said operationalizing research. And there's this uh, realization that a lot of folks, uh, particularly at companies like Envision, have realized that we need to operationalize research. I'm curious, what is operationalizing research to you? To me, it's making it accessible to everyone in the organization. I know you know, research is this team sport. It's something that's done by everyone in our team, uh, not just as a product team, but at Envision, it's also done by our support team, our sales team, our customer success team. We have a lot of um, educational teams as well. For instance, Aaron Walter, I know you just spoke with him. Uh, he talks with a lot of customers and users of Envision, and we all really collectively work together as a research team. And part of that is really 
coming up with our process that works for us, but is accessible to everyone. So you don't need to be a designer with advanced equipment and everything set up to do research. We actually have it more operationalized, part of our process, part of our toolkit, and everyone can do that. We have process in place as well to share those findings and communicate with one another. That's awesome. Okay, so to go back in summary, operationally, uh, excuse me, operationalizing research for you is is quite simply making it accessible to everyone in the company, not just researchers, right? Absolutely. And I think it's so important because everyone wants to be a part of the design process. I know I've worked in several different companies. I've worked in agency environments and everyone wants to be a designer. They want to collaborate with designers and work together. And so I think having that process in place really lets them feel like they're part of the process and they're actually helping to build the product, even if they're not designing it with a capital D. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think that's important. And uh, in fact, conversations that I've had around this, Lindsay, I would argue everybody is a designer in their own right. In fact, you know, one of the things Joseph and I have discussed on our Insider Alias track of our podcast is the need for developers to have a stake in this stuff, developers and engineers and, and, and people on the technology side, because they are a humongous contributor, if, if nothing, then by pure ratio of people, right, like engineers or developers to designers uh, in creating the experience. So, yeah, I love to hear that. That's awesome. I mean, so in that case, right, like your role is to really help do that and roll that out at Envision. Uh, how does that work? How do you make that more accessible to everybody who's not on the research team? Yeah, so fun fact, our research team is actually one person. It's just me. And that's why my role is around research operations. Um, we have a larger team of designers. I think we're around 18 to 20. Our design team has largely done a lot of the user research team in partnership with our product management team. So I've been brought in, um, actually, I joined the company three years ago, so it was even even before we had PMs. Um, however, the role that I've kind of taken on organically is taking a lot of the weight off of designers and product managers so that they don't have to think about that process. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I set, to, I set up best practices, a lot of templates and resources that are available internally. And I kind of lead by example. So I will partner with designers and PMs who maybe aren't as confident doing their own research or haven't done a research using a particular method. I will partner up with them on a research and design sprint where the focus is, of course, building better product, but also leveling them up as a researcher so that they can make educated decisions. And by doing that, I can give them feedback, we can work on any of their weaker areas. And I also know where their strengths are and what types of research they're really successful at doing because then they can take that role the next time that another designer needs to go off and do usability testing, for example. And I can say, hey, grab this designer over there. He can really help you with this. He's done this research previously and he knows how it works. So I'm constantly just communicating that process, the resources that are available to our team, and also just sharing continuously so that as other folks do their own research, they know where to share it, they know who to share it with, and they know where to even contribute um, new documentation, new templates, and new resources for our team. Okay, interesting. There's there's a lot you said there, and I kind of want to dive into a couple different things. But the the biggest theme I hear you talking about, Lindsay, is the fact that this seems really like that role in operationalizing research is teach a man to fish. It's just in a, in a short phrase. Is that is that accurate? Absolutely, but also a woman to fish. Yeah, of course, of course. Teach a person to fish. teach a teach a hungry person to fish. Absolutely. So we do have about, I'm going to do a rough estimate, like 20 designers and about 20 product managers. So I do work across those teams, educating them and teaching them to fish. Right. Okay. And so it's, uh, so it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it kind of sounds like these folks are off largely doing a lot of their own research, um, you know, under your assistance and, uh, and maybe tutorship. As, as needed. 
Absolutely. Yes. Huh. Okay. Very good. And so as they're off running and doing all of this, I can imagine that very quickly, you know, or even you identified this before it happened that, well, everybody doing their own research is really great and very efficient, but then how does that come back to one central hive mind, right? How, how do you, how can other than people then benefit from research that maybe another team did? Yeah, it can be a hot mess. So <laughs> what we've done to address that is I just recently talked about the resources and practices that we have put together. So we sort of have these step-by-step -step guides for conducting research. And part of that process is actually sharing research. I Research that isn't shared is research that hasn't been done. That's kind of my philosophy. So we do a couple of different things where I will keep the entire product team and organization in the loop with active research that's going on, current findings, um, even if a sprint isn't over. I kind of call it, I jokingly call it the insights newsletter, mm -hmm. but I do this fun little capitalization so it looks like Envision. Um, so it's an insights newsletter that we send around to the entire organization, including our leadership team. And it's just kind of a f more fun status report of everything that's going on, all the research that's being conducted, surveys that are out to our users. And people love to receive that. And a lot of times they will reach back out and say, oh, that actually reminds me, I just had a conversation with Lyft and this was an issue with them as well. They could be a great candidate for that usability test. And so everyone kind of just pulls together based on that those insights that get sent around. Mm -hmm. Another thing we do is we've established best practices for naming conventions. We keep all of the research notes, findings um, in the same Dropbox folder. Mm -hmm. So we actually use Dropbox paper and Dropbox for file storage. Um, that's just tends to be where our product management team and our design team lives for documentation. So my theory has always just been it's really not a theory. My practice has always just been to keep the research where the team is. Mm -hmm. um, I find a lot of times whenever it goes to a different place, then they stop looking. Um, so this way it's accessible to everyone in our team and they can kind of search for keywords that apply to them. But it's also nicely organized um, in a way that really kind of mimics, mimics our organizational chart. Okay, fascinating. And, and through this entire process, you are sort of the master of worlds, uh, orchestrating a lot of this behind the scenes. I it like sounds that like term. the master of worlds. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So yeah, this is, this is really, really fascinating. I mean, the, the research newsletter is uh, for me an interesting concept because it's just, um, well, I won't presume anything. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, what is entailed in something like a research newsletter, right? I suspect that your goal there is to, hey, everybody, here's here's some activity that's going on. Read it. You can latch onto it as needed, and then connect with you know the respective parties on your own as you need to or as you see fit. I know newsletters have you so excited, don't they? Well, I think it's um, a brilliant idea. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not I'm not blowing smoke here. I think it's I think it's I think it is clever because it's simple and easy are mutually exclusive right like making something simple is not easy and so i think that i think that what you've done there is is very interesting way of making it simple yeah i know a lot of people want to get away from e email newsletters but we are a distributed company of over 600 employees so a lot of our important company communications do happen through email and the newsletter is one of them what we include in that, often it's really twofold. We have a mission of building empathy across our entire company. And then our other mission is to support those product teams, kind of let them connect the dots when there are related things. To be fair, we are a small enough team that when research is happening that I feel overlaps or where two teams can partner up, I will just tell them that. <laughs> but. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. The research newsletter does, it kind of spans across to include a lot more engineers, our people in our biz ops team. So they're not always involved in what's going on in our product team or the product research, but often they're doing user research to better understand and build empathy with our users. 
So the newsletter has this format where I'll start it with what I call a cool customer story. And this is usually just a call that I've done with any user. And I really just go deep into who they are and their experience with our product. It's not actually meant to kick anyone's, you know, butt into gear and get them fixing things. It's really just getting a connection with our users. And then once we get past that, I'll talk about here's ongoing research projects, here's the status, here's who involved in the, who is involved in those. Mm-hmm. Um, here are some key insights we've found so far, but hey, we haven't distilled all of our findings yet. These are just some fun facts that we're working with. Um, and then we'll move into kind of a pulse on the community. And that's where we start listing out what's working, what's not working, and what's getting mixed reviews in our community. So I'll pull in feedback from interviews we've done, feedback from sales folks who have shared their research findings with us, sometimes tweets, um, you know, people getting really excited about products, Mm -hmm. or even people really struggling with something. And again, that part is really to support the product team, to help them understand. We have like this organization where we, we don't categorize things too specifically. It's a really general categorization. Mm -hmm. So they can read through all of that and again, connect the dots themselves. Yeah. This is, this is awesome. This is awesome. Okay. So I have, I think a pretty good idea on how you're helping people connect the dots and even connect people in this case, right, um, from what you've just shared with us there. I want to go back a little bit more into the uh, the Dropbox organization or whatever. So it doesn't matter the tool you're using, right, but this things are pretty well organized. Um, you have some standard naming conventions. I don't know how much you're able to share, but you know, how did you work through that and agree on it so that, let's say, I stumble into, I'm a new employee at Envision. I want to stumble into um, the place you have this research and learn about a particular topic right? How did you, how did you and your team figure that out? Yeah, this piece is incredibly important to me. I did just talk about how we are a remote team. So, you know, when we have a new designer or a new PM, I might be asleep on their first day when they start because of all these time zone differences. Mm -hmm. And so I want, I never want myself or any researcher to be a wall between anyone on our team and people getting to know our end users. So I do have this kind of, I'm trying to think of the term that I called it now that we're talking, it's escaped my brain. Um, It's a getting started guide Mm -hmm. at Envision for folks to understand who our users are. I have in that document really high level, here's who our users are, here's where they're located, here's what they do, and maybe some fun stats in there, Mm -hmm. but I also point them to all the resources that are available to them. And we'll specifically call out um, when a person joins, we put together their onboarding experience, which is really personalized for them. And so those assets are included in their onboarding experience. When they're joining a product team, we say, hey, here's the team you're working with. Here's everything they're doing, all the problems they're trying to solve. And we kind of just do this drinking from a fire hose thing (laughs) where they get to spend, you know, a couple of days just really trying to absorb. Mm -hmm. But then I, you know, I will meet with them as well and and talk in a more targeted fashion. But because the organization mimics the team organization, I think it's really easy for them to pick up. We researched our team to actually set up that organization. I was having a problem where product managers and designers weren't actually doing self-serve research. I was getting the Slack messages. Hey, Lindsay, what do we know about product managers and how they use prototypes? Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting that from 18 PMs (laughs) is a lot to manage. (laughs) And so, you know, we put together these guides to help serve them better and also did a lot of research on how product managers approach problem solving at Envision as well as designers. And then we were able to kind of work up a system that worked for them. Okay. This is wonderful. So a couple of things there that I, you know, you talked about is when there's a new person, and, and this sounds like maybe not even just a new designer, uh, but almost anybody new to Envision, hey, here's here's what we know about our customers. This is part of your onboarding process. That's 
that's a huge deal. And I, and I, I would applaud you and envision for that because I think that that's in many cases, light years ahead of other companies and how they onboard people. Uh, <laughs> if I'm reading that correctly, which is, that's awesome in and of itself. But then the second piece, which is again, you as master of worlds and what you know about, you know, your customers and envision is, is you will actually create these jumpstart guides or these, uh, you know, what we might formally have called research reports about these, these areas of interest or these themes that you would then point somebody to uh, maybe, you know, respective to their role at the company. Is that accurate? Um, it's really close. We, we split our team in what we call zones, which is a general problem space. Hmm. And so we have a kickstart guide for each of those zones. Um, so I don't get super specific to that individual. I save that for our one-on-one -on -one where we just kind of do a meet and greet. Um, however, we do have like, this is research for this problem space. And here's who's part of that. Here's what's going on. And, you know, here's how to dig in more and really dive deep. Yeah. Awesome. And this uh, quick start guide is, is your, is you're referring to it as for these zones then? Yes, correct. And this is, and this is really uh, based on the structure, as you said, research that you did with your own team and understanding the structure of the company and the teams, which is brilliant, right? Um, for two reasons, at least in my opinion, because too many companies, and I'm sure that you've, you've come across this in your own research, are really, they're broken up by discipline. They're not necessarily broken up by, as you would say, and they are in a vision, problem to solve. And that's, uh, that's awesome. So that makes it a little bit more manageable, right? To say, well, here's what we know about this problem. Uh, here's what we know about solving this problem. Go nuts. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, okay. Uh, let's, let's kind of zoom out a little bit. And I can imagine that there's some folks maybe listening to this and say, hey, listen, Envision's really got their act together. That's cool. Uh, maybe where I work doesn't. And I would like to get started organizing information in this way you know, bringing user research more, you know, to the masses, to the teams in such a way, you know, it can be a daunting task. Do you have any advice for those people of maybe where to start? Yeah, the way I started this, you know, I actually just created a paper document in the same way that a product manager would open something and start making a requirements document or a brain dump of ideas. And I really just kind of started with, this is our research team here's what we do and here's how we work. And I was able to pull in, just think about all the questions you get asked every day as a researcher. Where can I find this? Do we keep our feature requests in this other system? Where can I find all the bugs for these, this product area? And I kind of started mentally taking notes of the common questions that I would get. And then the next time I would get that question, I would actually spin up a document for it. So rather than answering that question or immediately um, scheduling time with that person, I would say, okay, I've gotten this question three times now. This is going to happen more. And I stop what I'm doing. I think it took me 15 or 20 minutes to do it the first time that I did it. And I literally just jotted down a bunch of notes, shared it with them. They loved it, and then I communicated it to the larger product team. And people were commending me like, oh, that's so great that you documented this, thank you. So it's really just finding what's confusing for your team and just starting to put some type of process around it. Because even if you don't get it perfect the first time, mm -hmm. you're going to start getting that collaborative feedback and they're gonna say, yeah, I actually also really like knowing this thing about you know, this data set, can you please include that? And then eventually you're going to build out this more cohesive, like quick start guide. Mm -hmm. And then I pieced those together into a super high level quick start guide. So I focused on the team that I work with the most first, mm -hmm. and then I kind of built out <clears throat> to handle, I guess, the broader Envision company. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really, really good. So uh, I'm going to try to pull apart a few threads of that, Lindsay, if I could. The first thing. Yeah. Okay, good. I have your permission. Thank you. <laughs> um, the first thing, at least what I keyed on there is that you really focused on the question. Okay. Right. So you, you were getting asked a question by a team 
And once that happened, you know, more than once you said, yeah, here we go. Now we're going to create this document. Now, I, I assume that took the, the form of some sort of text document, maybe. Um, it did. Yep. Awesome. And, and you just kind of curated these answers. And maybe that's the, the, the correct or incorrect word, but curated these answers in this, in this thing, this text document and just said, yep, well, here you go. I've heard this enough. Don't worry. Um, I got you covered. Here's this thing. And you just kind of build off that until it became this, this larger uh, quick start guide. I mean, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. I almost could think of it as like a glorified FAQ for a researcher. Hmm. And then, yeah, I love the term just curating that, like wh what do you not have answered somewhere? Or maybe it's answered, but it's not visible. So you just need to bring that visibility to that information, which is probably somewhere, right? And as a researcher, you probably know where it is or you can guess. So you just need to make that more accessible. That is awesome. I mean, I, I really, really love the idea of keying this around questions. Um, the reason I say that, and, uh, you know, obviously part of what we do well, not part of the reason we exist at Aurelius is to try to help people get more out of their user research, right? And so a lot of people use us for this, you know, what they often call is like a research repository or a central hub, right? I mean, people would have different names for it and what we're doing, but at the end of the day, it really is. And I've actually said this in some talks that I've given, um, research is not, uh, you know, you never sell research. We never do research for the sake of research. Research is answers to a question. So I really, really love your approach that, that you said, well, look, there's, you know, there are people who need answers to these questions and uh, let's find some commonality there. Let's create this sort of, you know, systematic guide that can help people get to that same level of knowledge, maybe people who've been there for a year or more. And, uh, and then let's build on that as appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. That's awesome. Um, so then, you know, the other question I have is, is it sounds to me like, you know, you and your team at Envision has done a very good job at creating this system with, you know, answers to questions, common questions based on themes, and then the quick sides that, uh, I'm sorry, the quick start guides that kind of get you there. Uh, what happens as new questions arise that maybe have not been answered? Yeah, so we have been doing a lot of um, design sprints. Obviously, this group is probably really familiar with them because of things like, you know, Lean UX and um, Sprint. So we've been putting more and more design and research sprints into action. Mm -hmm. And we, I'll partner with a designer. Often we'll bring in a product manager and engineer as well. And we'll just kind of document all the questions we have as a team. And then we'll kind of start picking those apart and building out a research plan. Um, obviously, different questions, we need to approach solving them or answering them in different ways. And so we'll kind of work as a team to prioritize those questions, understand the impact of those questions, like what's gonna happen when we know the answer? Are we actually willing to you know, change? Are we willing to you know, pivot and, and go a, a different direction based on our findings. And we'll really just have that honest heart to heart as a team. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go out to our users and actually do that research. We usually time box it in two weeks. I know a lot of people do one week, but that can be really challenging with a remote wow. team when you're trying to partner up, you know, with a designer in Ireland and I'm here in Cleveland <laughs> and <laughs> we need to work with users who are maybe on the West Coast. So, you know, we, we've extended that to about two weeks and we'll do concept exploration and definitely the goal is building out a prototype with an idea. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes we decide not to actually solve that problem, but it was valuable for us to do that research and make that decision. Okay, wow. Uh, so, so let me get this right. The, that two-week iteration or sprint is for research specifically or, or research and, hey, prototype at the end of that? I mean, I want to call it research specifically because I think the building the prototype is the outcome of the research sure. for those sprints. Um, but it really is purely exploration. 
Got it. Okay. That's great. Well, and that's actually, I mean, I would still, <laughs> uh, having done a lot of this work myself, I would still say that's <laughs> relatively aggressive, right? Especially with a distributed team. Right. Yeah, it can get, you know, especially if we get two designers on that or something, sometimes designers are really passionate about certain problem spaces and they really want to be involved. So, you know, as the team grows, you get too many cooks, but they're a lot of fun. They're a lot of work. But, you know, we really like the pressure that it keeps us in that two week sprint because otherwise you can just go on for forever and forever, just trying to fine tune everything and solve every problem. So it's just about constantly checking, like staying focused on the initial problem or the initial question that we were trying to answer because otherwise we can go down a rabbit hole. Yeah, I think that that's actually a very, very insightful thing that you just said there because um, and I'm trying to remember, I read something about this recently, Parkinson's law, I believe it is. Basically it suggests, right? Like if you give yourself a month, the task will take a month. Um, and Absolutely. The, and, yeah. And the time boxing thing is such a big, big deal. And I want to give a shout out, um, to somebody we have not yet had on the podcast, but we absolutely should former adaptive path and forester analyst, uh, Leah Buley. So she wrote, um, UX team of one, if anybody's familiar with that book, she way back at her time at adaptive path. And her sketching and interaction design process uh, specifically time boxed her stuff um, and just even coming up with solutions, right? So I love the idea of time boxing research to say, well, look, <laughs> we're going to get an answer. Um, we're either going to be confident or not in that answer in the end of two weeks. And it sounds like, as you said, we'll pursue a solution to that problem or we won't. Right. Exactly. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'm especially with research. Okay. Sorry. Especially with research. I think it's important to time box it because there are so many open questions all the time. And you just said, never do research for the sake of doing research, right? Mm -hmm. So you always need to make sure that you're answering the right questions that are going to benefit your team. And you're not just doing it arbitrarily because you have the time. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, so uh, what you just said there leads me to one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Lindsay, which is you talk to me about how, you know, we find these questions that we determine should get answered. And, and what I mean there, just to clarify, is there's this idea of, you know, broad reaching research, which is really about, you know, what are we doing for customers as a whole in our company or our entity that we work for, right? And then there's this idea of, well, you know, I work on the onboarding team, or I work on the article sharing team, whatever it might be. And, we're, and there's specific tactical problems we're trying to research there. It's very different kind of research, right? So how do you manage those different sets of questions and, and sort of how do those come through the, the pipeline for you? Yeah, that can be especially challenging because our team has grown so much. And, you know, it's really hard to scale your, your process with your team mm -hmm. in the same amount of time, right? Like your team often scales before your process. Um, so we have a core four set of yearly themes. And these themes are communicated across the entire organization. And as a design team, as a product team, we come up with our, our own subset of themes, which tie directly into those core company themes for the year, or those core company goals for the year. And every project that we work on, of course, everyone always talks about, you know, our, our KPIs or OKRs, mm -hmm. but whatever project we're working on, we directly tie them into what those higher level goals are. So within design, we tie that in with our design team goals, which are then tied into our Envision as a company goals. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. We've, we've talked quite a bit about this on our podcast, and I cannot tell you how much you are tugging at my heartstrings, Lindsay, because, you know, as a designer and, uh, I don't know, product strategy person, that's... I often talk about this very unsexy work of creating goals, right? Like that's not something that we think that we, we really ought to be doing or focused on as, as designers and researchers and UX folks, but it is such a big deal. And I am, I am in love with the fact that Envision goes, yep, here's the things that we're focused on. And we will only do projects that are in line with that because we know that these are good for the business and our customers. Um, no, absolutely. That makes sense. And that's great because anybody who's heard our podcast, um, and listened specifically to Christina Woodkey, who wrote a book about 
OKRs and uh, a, a very, very brilliant episode I would encourage anybody to go back and listen to. She talks about this and how important it is to help focus, uh, you know, which projects you do and then focus the efforts even tactically in how you do those projects. Yeah, absolutely. And we continuously report on those as well. Like each quarter, just again, gut check. Are we working towards those goals? Are we working on the right things? Um, you know, in the design industry, it can be really difficult because designers are so passionate. Mm -hmm. Do you like that word passionate? They're always. They're <laughs> that always sounds politically media. correct. That sounds like you're pulling a punch there, Lindsay. I'm going to be honest with you. So they're on Medium, they're on Twitter, they're sharing all of their opinions about <laughs> right. every single thing all the time. And it's so easy to fall into that state of being reactive when you see something and you immediately, especially as a researcher, but also just envision as a company, you see that and you want to fix their problem. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a problem that we've struggled with in the past where you just want to please that one person and make them happy. But we've gotten so much better at actually saying, wait. That's, you know, one or two people. Let's see, is this a problem that's aligned with our goals? We can't get distracted. We have to stay focused. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, everything you read about strategy, it's more about saying no to the things you shouldn't do than it is about saying yes to the things you can do. And I just, I personally live by this, this quote or this mantra that just because I can doesn't mean I should. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a really big deal. And I think, you know, and it's a tribute to you um, and the team at Envision to, to say that it's a certain level of maturity that you reach where you understand, yep, there's a lot of things we can do. There's a lot of problems we can solve, but which ones should we? And that's, uh, that's a lot more difficult. So I, it, bringing it back to where we sort of started with this, Lindsay, is, you know, those are those bigger research questions. Those are those, hey, this is what the company's trying to do this year what do we need to learn um, right, from customers to achieve yeah. that? And then there's a, there's a difference between that and then this, well, how do we make the interactions on this thing or this feature we've already built uh, better and more efficient? Yeah, I tend to focus on more of that strategic research um, just because I am the sole dedicated UX researcher on our team. So a lot of the more tactical research is happening embedded with that design team and that product management team. Um, I tend to stick with kind of the more foundational projects um, that do span across all of our different teams. And I really like the job to be done framework. Um, we don't necessarily have one absolute process or methodology that we stick to as a product team, but a lot of folks on our product management team really enjoy the job suite done framework too. And I like it because it does keep you focused on those ultimate goals, the ultimate questions that need answered, and making sure that we, again, are solving the right problems for our users. And it may even be uncovering the fact that we're totally not focusing on something that we should be. So that's typically where I partner up with, you know, our biz ops team, our yeah. growth team, and you know, myself, we're working on a project right now doing that. Ah, oh, that's such, I mean, you are doing, in my opinion, you are doing such important work with that because I don't believe that there are enough teams and companies really focusing on making sure they're solving the right problems and they're, and they're far too focused on iterating on solutions that have already been created or decided on, right? And so what I hear you talking about is, yeah, you're working, as you said, maybe you know, the BizOps team and other things at Envision to say, let's make sure we're doing research to inform the right problem to pursue that. Let's be confident we're doing that first. And then, you know, going back to what you said earlier in, in, this, in this way of uh, autonomy you're providing and uh, in that whole teach a person to fish with the teams is, is, yeah, you've got the tools and the resources yourself to iterate and do the research to make sure the solution is as efficient and refined as it can be. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, that's kind of, we've found a lot of success just building the team up like that. We are growing the research team, but it's to help support more of that foundational and, and strategic research that needs done. That is really, really good. I, uh, I would be very curious to hear 
a little bit more about how you do that intake process with, you know, your biz ops team and whoever else you're working with, and then translate that, you know, to the, um, the more operational product teams. It's, this is very timely for me too, because you know, at, the, at the time we will release this episode, it will be long launched, but I just wrote an article uh, about the what versus how, right? And so in design and product development for me, I've always advocated for people to figure out your what. Get everybody on board in agreement with what you're designing or building before you ever figure out the how, right? And so it sounds like, you know, the Envision team has absolutely been operating under this level of uh, maturity for some time now where it's, yep, these are, this is a problem we're going to solve. We are going to make this feature, this capability, or this job to be done. Once we get everybody aligned on that, then we determine the best way how to execute that solution. Yeah. So the way that we're doing that right now, we have kind of a sub team made up of myself, um, one of the uh, biz ops guys. I'm also working with the marketing operations team and our data scientists. And we're really working to aggregate all of our research that's happening. So we're kind of asking this question from a bunch of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And then we're going off on our research sprints as this more focused team um you know we're not building out prototypes or anything like that we're actually just researching you know why are why are you here what are you trying to do (laughs) to make sure you know when you grow to the number of users that we have now and as our design industry becomes more sophisticated obviously the problems that they're trying to solve are so much different than they were three years ago yeah and so we're really doing this gut check um on our user base, like making sure that we're solving the right problems. Of course, we've been doing it continuously through building up those different products and features that we're working on. But as a core company, we want to make sure that we understand who's actually coming into the product and using it and what value they're getting out of it. Um, We've even actually identified a gap in our product thinking where Mm -hmm. we as a company just overlooked this completely and you know oh that's an edge case but guess what it's not an edge case anymore it's a reality and we have not just the qualitative information to back that up but because we're partnering with our data scientists we have the qualitative information to back that up and that behavioral analysis and then working with biz ops we can also say here's the impact on our company growth which Obviously, our leadership team, our board team, they they absolutely care about that. Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is huge, huge stuff that you're sharing here. Uh, And to be honest, it also reminds me a little bit of I want to I want to reference some stuff that we we talked with Indy Young about. So um, we had her on the show, and she she, so she's obviously written and contributed some very seminal work of user research in our field. Uh, with her book, Mental Models and everything else. But she now talks about the idea of this problem space research. And it very much sounds like that's what, you know, you and your team and Envision as a company uh, and as a whole are are pursuing is to say, this is the problem space. And I love the fact that you are partnering with some of the people who go, well, here's what some of the numbers tell us. Let's let's get an understanding of, right? So we, we talked about the what and the how. Uh, we can get the what which numbers can tell us and data science can tell us, but we don't know the why. And that very much, I believe, is where you and qualitative user research comes in to make actual business decisions. This, these are the things we yeah. should do, right? Like to really change the tide of how we serve the people we care about uh, as a company. Absolutely. Um, I listened to that episode. It really resonated with me too. Awesome. I was like, yes, I'm doing the thing that she's talking about. and I'm feeling great about it. That's awesome. Well, it sure sounds like it to me. I mean, I don't, I'm certainly not an expert in uh, anywhere near the level of indie or, or likely yourself, but I think uh, I'm decent at synthesizing information. And it certainly sounds like uh, the same thing. And that's, it's awesome to hear that in practice uh, from you, Lindsay. And so then that leads me to the question of just asking, so then tell me a little bit more about how that happens, right? So yes, we're leading the, uh, the more tactical product theme teams to, you know, be left to their own devices. You can optimize your, your features and areas of your product on your own will. Talk to me about how somebody engages you 
for this more foundational directional research? Yeah, so this came out of a larger strategy discussion where I was meeting with the design and product leadership teams and you know, we were talking about how we've just been getting a lot of questions about you know, from our marketing team, from our biz ops team where it was really and I love this, our board wanted to know more information. Oh and I goodness. had to tell them I was like, you guys, I I don't know the answer. We need to kick off research. And so we did. And our team has been incredibly supportive about that. And it's really super fun to have like our biz ops team and our data scientists joining in on these research calls. And the synthesis part is really interesting because most of the time my synthesis happens with designers and product managers, um, as well as some engineers. But now I'm getting the perspective of these data scientists who are really thinking in numbers and the trends that they're seeing in all of their dashboards and reporting. And now they're getting a face and this user and their experience, and they're involved in that discussion, and then they're involved in that synthesis as well. And so they give me a totally different perspective when it comes to kind of boiling down our insights and you know, rolling things into all of our recommendations because they're thinking, oh, we, we need to track this other information. We're not, we don't have tracking on this event. If we could build our dashboard in this other way, we'll get this better picture and we can continue to report on this. So it's really fun to have that holistic perspective of information yeah okay well this is like relatively uncharted territory for a lot of people to 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 hear that not only are you interfacing and getting requests from the board of advisors and, and, and directors of a company but also then communicating that back out i mean i just have to ask i mean how does this go right because I have to suspect a lot of those folks are not super familiar with the way that we work, design thinking, user research, and synthesizing this information, but they're hungry for it. And this sounds like the perfect storm and an awesome opportunity where I have to ask this question. Yeah. So the way I've been doing this is I tend to work in paper documents and I'll sometimes have a supportive spreadsheet there. And so we get together on a video conferencing call and we share and we look at this data at the same time and we can each you know make our pivot tables and they can see the way i've organized things to kind of tell a, a customer experience story often i will have i'll actually build the customer journey with them as part of that discussion hmm. really super simple like using envision freehand we draw a couple of boxes and add our text in there. And then we refer back to specific individuals. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see if I can explain this well. So we often have a large subset of data and we will talk to a very small group of individuals that are inside that subset of data. So we can say this many people have this job title, are using Envision this way and having these types of problems. And that's the quantitative piece of that. We can say 30% of the users are experiencing this specific problem. But then we've also had a couple of conversations with people who meet that criteria mm -hmm. and we can really build out that story. So it it's ultimately about the story, building out that customer journey, um, building empathy, going through the exact key points of how they use the product, where their pain points are, workarounds that they're doing, um, and focusing on how successful we are at solving their problem. A lot of times people aren't coming to Envision necessarily because they want a prototype. They're coming to Envision because they want to look really good to their team showing off this professional design that's mm -hmm. fully prototyped out and they really look like they know they've got their stuff together. Yeah. And so it's really, again, focusing on how successful are we making those users feel using the product. So I try to keep the team focused on answering some of those qualitative questions as we build out those, those story maps and customer journeys. Yeah, I think, oh my goodness, Lindsay, that's such an important point that you're sharing there because it's this quote that just keeps coming back to me and everything you just shared. Um, and I, I can't even remember who to attribute it to, but 
it basically says like, uh, you know, when you're selling a quarter inch drill bit, people don't want a quarter inch drill bit. They want a quarter inch hole, right? Like there's, there's some means to an end and that's, you know, right. what you're doing is serving that, that, that need. It's not that people want a prototype. They want a prototype that is serving some other means to an end. And I think that that is just so intricate and insightful that it's very, very important for people listening to this episode to think about that as they are doing research with people and understanding their needs. Um, as you said, not just reacting to a problem, right? Because, because the data science will tell you that. Well, look, 67% um, of people are having this problem with this job title. Let's go and, let's go and solve that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, don't, hold on, right? Like, let's, let's understand why that problem exists and what solving it does for them. All of a sudden, that unlocks this more beautiful place of understanding on how we can actually um, meet that need for them, right? Yeah. And I think it's fun to take those moments and put your humility on the back burner and really think about how you are helping them be successful. And then you can kind of steal their mission too, to, to motivate you. Like you as Aurelius, you are helping researchers um, store and share insights with their larger team. If your customer is a healthcare company, um, you know, you're ultimately helping those people help patients of their company or I'm sorry, patients of their physicians or something like that. And so you can kind of take their mission and use that to motivate you to solve their problems, which I think is really exciting in the software space. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. All right. Well, Lindsay, this is a conversation I'm quite sure we can go for very much longer, but we're running up to the end of the time and I want to be respectful of that for you. Um, you know, one of the things I've tried to be consistent about in asking our guests at the end of each one is if, if I had temporary amnesia and <laughs> Uh, there was only one thing people listening to this episode should take away. What do you think that should be? I think it should be making research accessible. Um, we've talked on and on, and I know the community talks on and on about how research is a team sport. And so I think as researchers, it's our responsibility to share our knowledge and make our our process and our methods more accessible. People are, are more inclined to participate if they aren't scared or intimidated by your team. You know, our jobs are to work with people and talk with people and empathize. So bring that into your team as well and make your research accessible. Yeah, I love it. I love that answer. Uh, take away, you know, the, the black arts and magic of what research is, empower people to do that and get everybody on your team right absolutely um, get everybody on the same page uh, as as hey we're all here to save the, serve the customer 100 percent. fantastic all right Lindsay, is there anything else that you want to share with people listening to this episode that maybe we didn't cover today yeah the research i've been focused on a lot at envision i've been talking a lot about our core foundational research and strategies so i just want to give a shout out to Envision Studio, which is currently in early access. So if anyone's interested in trying out an amazing new design tool, mm -hmm. um, definitely go to Envision and you'll find it. Um, and the other thing, it's a little bit further away, but we have um, Envision V7 coming out, which is almost a, a rebuild of our entire product, really focusing on performance and things that we've heard from our users and it's essentially built for you guys. So mm. I'm really excited about it. Mm, I love that. You heard it here first on the Aurelius podcast, Envision V7, uh, which the very brilliant Lindsay has been working on. And uh, that's very, very cool. And we'll include those things in the show notes. Um, Lindsay, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing this with uh, the folks listening to the episode. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. We will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also, you can fill out our podcast survey, 
where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to the Aurelius Podcast, the show where we talk with brilliant minds about user research, UX design, and building great products that meet the needs of real people and what you learned about them. Aurelius is a user research and insights tool for design and product teams. Aurelius helps you add, tag, organize, search, and share all of your user research notes and customer feedback insights to figure out what you learned faster and easier than ever before so you can make awesome designs, products, and features. Check us out for a free trial at AureliusLab.com. That is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Or find us on Twitter at AureliusLab. We'll see you next time. Thank you.